Toy Junkies. What's up, Golf Addicts? DB here. I got Pat Perry. It is the Tour Junkies podcast for the RBC Canadian Open, a 2019, a, and uh, we're excited. We're pumped. We are live on YouTube yet again for another fun leap of technology. You can see Pat. I can see Pat's lovely face as I record, which I always, always enjoy. Uh, Pat, good to see you, buddy. Good to talk to you. Uh, it's a big week for us, and it doesn't have a lot to do with the RBC Canadian Open, but it's, it's good to see you, man. How you doing? I'm good, man. It's good to see you as well. I'm ready for uh, an exciting week. Yeah, like you said, not, not just at the Canadian Open. I'm going to get crazy tonight on the podcast. I'm just going to tell you right now. I'm going to get a little crazy on the podcast tonight. Oh, mm-hmm. okay. I mean, I'm going I'm, I'm to get to Planet Tito's. I'm, just, I'm ready for the U.S. Open. I mean, look, I've put in the work, put in the research, but um, hey. I don't. It's just not all that exciting to me. There are no, there are no words that I enjoy hearing more than Pat saying he's going to get to Planet Tito's. It, it really, it really makes me happy. I'm excited about what could happen tonight. We've got a good chunk and run going tonight. We're going to hit a couple, a big issue that went down uh, this week. We might, we might get a little serious on the chunk and run tonight. Uh, so it's going to be great. It's going to be great. Um, let's get right to it, man. Patrick Cantlay won the Memorial. And you know what? I mean, we talked him up plenty. I absolutely loved Patrick Cantlay last week. I think everything else that I got right stops about there. Yeah, I think it stops about there. It was a horrible week. You know, I had a great week the week before at Colonial uh, in in DFS and, and, and betting. And then last week, I almost, I basically lost everything. So, you know, if you're, uh, if you're in this... Lots of ups and downs. Lots of ups and downs, you know? It's betting. It's gambling. It is what it is. Mm-hmm. Uh, we did have, I saw a few tweets. Apparently our listeners, we, we may have steered them a, a, a poor direction last week as well. Um, saw a few tweets that some people had some green screens, won a little bit of money. Fantastic. Um, but, yeah. All in all, it was not a good week for, for yours truly. But great to see Patrick Cantlay win. He's just a, stop, he's just a solid player. There's not many yeah. weeks I'm not on Patrick Cantlay. Well, of course, uh, you know I'm I'm the same way. I'm usually never uh, not on him, but uh, for some reason, just decided I wasn't going to play him this week, and mm-hmm. didn't work out for me. And I literally have him at least one, at least a lineup. Actually, yeah, we were talking about this. Like, I had him in like 70% of lineups in my in DFS on my player pool, and it didn't matter. <laughs> I had so many missed cuts uh, between, you know, Kucher and Keegan Brad. Kucher was chalk that I ate. Keegan Bradley uh, really, really screwed me late in the uh, late in the day on Friday, missing the cut. There were some other guys. It was just, you know, it wasn't it wasn't pretty. Kevin Strillman was a bright spot for me. I did have some Kevin Strillman. Hideki, as I, you know, mm-hmm. I knew he'd be solid. Um, but uh, yeah, so we we just had a listener comment. I had a really good Thursday. And then it all went to crap. So he got drunk all weekend. Shout out smoking guns. Way to go. You know, I mean that's kind of. <laughs> I like that guy. Yeah, I mean, you know, sometimes like that's, that what you, that's what you got to do. You kind of like have to just move on. And uh, and and it's gambling. You know, it's going to happen. It happens to everybody. And and that's a good lesson. You know, like just just move on. It's a great tournament to watch, though. I did I did enjoy watching the memorial. Um, you know, that's about it. But C- Patrick Cantlay winning was probably the the most low-key storyline of the golf world this Hmm. past week you know we talked about golf has been very interesting there's been a lot of interesting things go down in 2019 it felt like we were in a lull and then all of a sudden it started with uh, you know a lot of people forget but it started with Bryson DeChambeau uh, and and getting a warning for his slow ass play um, that then was directly forgotten almost immediately because of Matt Kuchar's pitch mark ruling and his ridiculousness continued. And then you had the Hank Haney thing happen last week, which we will discuss in the chunk and run portion of tonight's podcast. But there was just a lot of activity going on last week. Pat, any thoughts on the Bryson or Kuchar situation? Your boy Kuchar. I mean, do you want to 
be the 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 old man apologist here for your boy Matt Kuchar and his shit and grin self. No, you know, I mean that that whole episode was just so freaking weird to me, and I mean. At first, I'm trying to. I had to watch it over and over, trying to understand what the hell it was he was actually trying to argue for. I mean, it just was. It, it was. I agree. It was. It, it, he could have been right too with with what he was arguing about. I, I don't know. But the whole like way you're you're asking for a second opinion, and then he goes, "Well, can I get a third? Yeah. <laughs> I'm like, dude, just give it a rest. I mean, yeah. I just. It was a little bit ridiculous. And Bryson is Bryson. I don't know. I mean, I was sh- he actually got his game a little bit together over the, the tournament. I, I'm I'm kind of like with Bryson. I think, you know, you, you definitely have to ride him when he's hot. But he's got all this scientific crap going on in his mind. So, like, when the when the gears aren't working all correctly, you know, like every, everything's not moving in sync, I, I, I definitely like to fade him. But he he was actually okay, especially over the weekend. But, yeah. Um, and, and he's just, yeah. And then he, the comment, though, about how, well, maybe people should just get to the ball quicker. Like, it's it's not just what they are over the ball. No, it is. It is. <laughs> you are over the ball. I mean, yeah. that that was a stupid comment. Well, on the Kuchar thing, it just further, it just further says what a tool that guy really is. And, and it's just all his crap has come to the surface in 2019. It is not the year of Kuchar. I continue to be anti Kucher. I will play him and I will bet on him, but I, I am out on on Kucher. Um, Do you think he just got tired of being loved for so long? <laughs> like, like he was just he's like Mr. Nice Guy on tour. He's you know he's just everybody loves some Cooch. Do you think he just decided this year or maybe yeah, actually back in the the fall maybe he was just going to be bad Cooch. He was just going to. He just wanted to see what it was going to be like for everybody to, to not like him and, and actually boo him on the course as opposed to to saying cooch. I don't know, man. I, I think he's I think he's just. Uh... I mean, how is it over all this time? I mean, however long he's been on tour. I mean, what twenty something years that this one year is the is the year that everybody finds out like who he who he actually is. I mean, not a peep from anybody. Not a peep from tour players. He hasn't let anything out that's made him look really like much of a, a douchebag. And then all of a sudden this year, like well, here, that's kind of that's a long deal, time though. to be able to to hide hide a, a character flaw like that. If if it, if this is a character flaw in Matt Kuchar, he has certainly held <laughs> kept it under wraps for a pretty long time. So I mean, is it could these these two incidents be outliers? Just, just saying, playing a little devil's advocate here. Akavit. Ak- uh, little devil's <laughs> act of it. We're already. Uh, well, uh, first of all, I mean, you have to discount the first half of Kucher's career because you didn't have mobile phones all over the place and social media doing what it's doing. And then, I mean, even just in the last year now with the social media policy on the PGA at a PGA Tour event, you've got even more cameras everywhere um, catching this. Well, stuff. and people on their phones and out stuff there going and stuff viral like that. the way that it's gone. However, the PGA Tour to speak to the how come players haven't said anything. To me, the PGA Tour, I mean, it's such a golf is, is – there is still a, a resemblance of the gentleman's game element at play in that these competitors I don't think are going to talk about each other and throw each other under the bus the way that, like, uh, I don't know, the NFL and, like, Juju Smith-Schuster and Antonio Brown are doing right now or, like, half the Steelers or, you know, it, or the, the trash talking that goes on in the NBA when a player – leaves one locker room and goes to another and the teammates from the former locker room are doing nothing but talking about him and bad mouthing him like it just doesn't happen on the PJ tour but i think when the whole thing came out about all two can we did see a few things you know a few uh, anonymous uh, tour players kind of coming out of the woodwork and saying that it didn't really surprise yeah. them. They, they'd seen behavior like this from cooch before i think he's just a miserly georgia tech guy so forget him <laughs> that's his problem uh, but I, I got to get in my Bryson punches here. It, it was kind of interesting because on Wednesday, I sat down and I watched Bryson's press conference uh, at, at the Memorial as defending champ. It was like a 17-minute press conference. It was the worst 17 minutes of my week last week. And God, How did you hang on for that long to watch that? I was hoping for a nugget of wisdom. Are you like, are you like trying to torture yourself? No, I was hoping for something, and nothing, nothing came of it, just frustration. 
you know, ever since Bryson came out on tour, it's documented on the podcast, I'm sure, if you went back and looked at it, but ever since he's come out on tour, both on the podcast and in our own private conversations between me and you, I've, I've, I've waffled on Bryson. I've been like, man, I like the guy. I don't like the guy. I can't really tell. I'm not really sure. I don't know how I feel about Bryson. And not that it matters to anybody but me. Um, but I was sitting there on Wednesday, and I'm watching his press conference. And I just was listening to the the just sewage that was pouring from his mouth and the look on his face. It's not just about listening to the audio. You have to watch his face. I have never seen a more arrogant, just, I am so, I am the smartest guy in this room. I know it, and I'm going to act like it. And I am so above you, and not only you as the, as the press in the room, but I'm so above the people that I'm playing against in, in, in what I've got in my dome, you know, that, that I am just, I am, I think Bryson gets a boner for himself. I, I, think he, I think he just starts thinking about himself a little bit, and he pops a chub. I think he's so full of himself, and he just exudes just arrogance. And to listen to the crap that he was spewing about golf, I, I literally watched the press conference and said, all right, I've decided I'm out. I'm out on Bryson DeChambeau. Again, not that I'm not going to play him. He's not one of these guys I'm going to write off in, in like playing him on DFS or betting on him. But in terms of liking the dude and pulling for the dude, he is going to go on the list of PGA Tour players that I will pull against at all costs. There are a handful mm-hmm. of those players, okay? A handful of those players that I will pull, I will pull against if they are on Sunday in the hunt. He is now on that list. I texted you and our boy Ben Little on Wednesday and said, it's official, I'm out on Bryson. I'm done, I'm out. The very next day, what does he do? He gets put on the clock, and he spits all his BS excuses about being a slow-ass guy on the PGA Tour, and it frustrates me to no end. Like, I wish somebody would just penalize the guy for being – for being, and, and I just – and then when you see Brooks play, and Brooks is like, it's a golf shot. Like, I've hit millions of them in my lifetime. I'm going to step up there, and I'm going to hit it. And you see what he's doing versus Bryson, and, and we're all subjected to his mumbo-jumbo in these press conferences and these – commercials and articles and crap and I'm 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 an, I'm now out. And and there are certain villains on the PGA tour that are villains that, that I kind of like to embrace. I I kind of like to embrace Patrick Reed a little bit. But Bryson oh, DeChambeau is no is not a villain that I am going to embrace. Absolutely not. It is official. Mark it down. I am out on Bryson DeChambeau. Cheers. Yeah, I mean good for you. Good for you. I'm glad that you were able to come to this decision. And thank you. Um, thank you. I, feel I mean, good. I, it feels I good. feel like you've. Yeah, I'm. I'm. I'm proud of you. I guess. Should I be proud of you? You can be. Yeah. I'm proud. Um, I'm proud of you for this. And um, you know, Bryson. Yeah, he's just a douchebag. I mean, he's an easy guy not to like. He. He is. Yeah. He is. Um, I'm getting a lot of. I'm getting a lot of affection for this take on YouTube from those watching live, which I appreciate. Thank you guys. Uh, it makes me feel good. I'm sure Are they I'm proud of you too? I don't know about pride, but they're, they're at least in agreement. Here's the thing. Um, we have, before we get into this golf course, it's a huge week for us, Pat. It's the member guest at my club, Champions Retreat. I'm excited. I can't wait to see mm-hmm. your face. I can't wait to, to play some golf with you. And, um, you know, a lot of people are going to skip this part of the podcast, and that's fine. So before you skip, I just want to let you know you may not be you may not have any interest in listening to us talk about this for the next couple of minutes, but you definitely need to queue up the notifications on Periscope and uh, and on Instagram Live. You you need to do that because um, because it's going to be good. And if you missed last year's Periscopes when we did the post round press conferences, uh. you missed some of the best. Tour Junkies content in four years. Am I wrong, Pat? Am I wrong on this? No, it was some, it was some really good stuff. It was you know, amazing and, content. And a lot of it too, of course. Um, you know, in the morning that we had had a morning and an evening press conference. Um, very yeah. different. Very, very a lot of different. contrasting things happening <laughs> in both of those. Um, but you know, I will say, like when I when I was up for the for the press conference in the evenings. Um, I mean, I was definitely buzzed. There was, there was, I was, I was probably drunk, but 
I kept it together. Like it was still yeah, like yeah. you could understand me. You know, there wasn't any you know slurring. Was well, maybe a little bit of slurring, but you could understand me. <laughs> and it was really just more funny, like that kind of stuff. Yeah. But in the mornings, the mornings was a little bit different, a little more serious. Um, <laughs> Debatable. Relatively yeah. serious. Yeah. D- day I'm, two. I mean, here's day what, two we hit. A, Here's what the listeners need to know is that last year Pat woke up and accidentally drank a loogie that I had spit in a water cup. Mm-hmm. And the the recap of that on the periscope was worth every everything. Um it was just electric. This is the biggest tournament of the year at my club. It is it is definitely a major. Um it's a it's it's got a very intense vibe. The shootout Making it to the shootout is our goal. That is our goal. We just want to get to the shootout. Um, it, it's it's an electric shootout. It really is. And we were close last year. We were very close. Came last down year. to our last match. Yeah. Didn't pull through, and I think and we if, learned a lot from that. If Mark Melton shows up, I don't know anything more than his name and what he did to us last year. I doubt he. I doubt he. Uh, I doubt he. He follows us. He was the guest, out-of-town guest of the member last year. But if Mark Melton, you mark my words, listeners, if Mark Melton shows up to the Champions Retreat 2019 member guest with a handicap over a nine, DB is going to roll some heads. That's all I got to say. That, uh, he's, uh, we're going to roll some heads. I, As a 10 last year, I gave him two shots mm-hmm. through nine holes, and he proceeded to shoot a even par 36 uh, gross I and, think he hit every fairway. Did not green. miss a fairway and did not miss a green. And that's yeah. how we lost going into the shootout. If Mark Melton shows up, I'm just telling you, I, I'm lit. Somebody on YouTube, KC Walton, is asking how our games are looking heading into the member guest. I mean, I think we've played this perfectly, Pat. Uh, now, if you guys have a member guest, you need, to, you need to take notes. And here's one of the notes you need to take. You know, definitely do what it takes to get your handicap up. In the in the in the the rounds of golf leading up to leading up to your member guest, okay, but then really hustle and put in the work, hit the range, right? Get the get the game in and do what I did yesterday. Go play a round of golf by yourself. Don't let people play with you. Don't let somebody else play with you. You know why you play by yourself? So that when you log a, a you know when you log a, a score three shots better than your handicap would suggest. You don't you don't have to record it because Gin says you you shouldn't record you're not allowed to record uh, rounds individually uh, that count for the handicap and that is what I did yesterday mm-hmm. played quite well yesterday Pat so personally my game feels really good right now I know you've been grinding you've been practicing we've both given each other the swing thoughts that we need to we need to remind mm-hmm. each other so I've told Pat you know it's like we're on the buddy system here I've said hey Pat. If I start getting wild, this is what I need you to tell me. This is what I'm working on right now. And I've also said, don't let me get buzzed, because I'm one of the few golfers who does not play better when I am buzzed or drunk. That is not me. A lot of people in this opposite, tournament will play opposite better. Opposite over here. <laughs> yeah, but I, I am not one better. of those. I, I need a, a, a Coke and a smile. That's what I need. Well, it's like last year, we, we regulated that well, I thought. you know We did. We did. Uh, you helped me with my regulation from, from a mm-hmm. drinking standpoint. And the, the t- we talk about the TT, TT to beer ratio. Yeah. Say hydrated. It was, mm-hmm. we, were, we were spot on last year with that. We, I yeah. mean, we didn't really, we didn't have any incidences where it was, it was bad. Um, so I think we just, we take that, what we learned with that, and then we go into this year, um, for one, not running up a, against a buzzsaw, that is um, Mark, Mark Melton. Melton. But, you know, we will uh, – I feel like we're, our games are good. And we had a little warm-up session, really, I would say, in my memory, I guess, which was, which was kind of like an exhibition kind of deal. Yeah. It, wasn't yeah. as, it wasn't as big as this one is. Yeah. And, uh, you know, and actually when it came down to the alternate shot, we did, we did do a little shootout. It was sort of a side thing. It wasn't to win the tournament. We we played pretty well in that, you know. We had we I had a huge mis- yeah. I had a huge mistake at, at one point. It was a shank, but yeah, I shanked it. <laughs> it was a gold um, shank. But that happens. That happens. You, you guys, a shank can happen yeah. to the best of us. We've seen Justin Thomas have yeah. one this year, pretty bad. So yeah. Anyway, it's going to be exciting. You know, we got a Calcutta on Thursday night. Uh, a lot of gambling going on. A lot of big dollars being slung around. Myself and Pat will have a stake in our own team. 
Uh, hopefully, no one else jumps in and wants to buy us, so we can. Keep Last it. year, nobody knew who we were, nobody and we got it. in cheap. I don't think that's going to happen this year, um, but we'll see. We'll see how it goes. Yeah. Uh, did you mention play- did making sure everybody's following us on Instagram? You know, we we, yeah. we do a lot of this on through the stories on Instagram and stuff Insta like stories. that. I think that's right. Yeah. yeah. Uh, at tour underscore junkies on Instagram as well. Yeah, I definitely want to do that. We tend to do more stories during these tournaments and stuff. Uh, now we have we, we have talked about this before, and actually my wife asked me about it yesterday, and now we're getting a question on YouTube about it. Are we doing matching outfits uh, at any point, Pat? What what are your thoughts on the <laughs> on the matching the matching azalea uh, polos? Are I'm you... pretty anti. I'm anti. <laughs> I'm I'm one of these guys that wants to be comfortable in the golf course, but but I'll say this. David, if, if you want us to do that, uh, if you feel like that's going to give us an edge, then I'll do it. But I, I feel like if we're going to do it, I want to request day one matching instead of day two matching. See, I, I, I if we're going to match, I think day two is the day because that could be the day we're in the Calcutta. That's when the team chemistry has to be the strongest. If we're in that mm-hmm. Calcutta and there are 100 golf carts – and you, mean the, you, mean the, you mean the shootout, and, not the Calcutta? And, and, I mean the shootout, and, and and everyone is watching. We need to be in those Azalea polos, standing strong as TJ. And, and I've been thinking about this a lot, because I know last time we talked about it, it got kind of heated. You were very against it. Um, I've been thinking about this a lot, and I'm willing to concede the the, the, the matching outfits. Um, I'm willing to concede that, because I know that you are a, a mental midget and when it comes to... <laughs> Like feeling comfortable and like being out of your your headspace or whatever, and I just know that if, if we're wearing those matching outfits against your will, y- you will be thinking about it and stewing over it and commenting on it all freaking day, and I just don't want that to happen. I just don't. So I wish that I had a partner that was a little more comfortable with that and could embrace the marketing kind of team side of this thing with those matching polos. You know, it's not like we're some. Win. It's not like we're some tools that like just bought matching polos at a store and decided to wear them. Like, there are polos. Like, it's this is us, homie. So, like, you know, somebody wants to yeah, say something, I, I'm like, look, bro, this is this is our company. Like, we designed these things. These are ours. We didn't – they're not they're not TJ Maxx's that you bought off the rack just so you match your boy. Like, we created these things. This is us. We're wearing our brand. That's what's different than these other guys, or you know, that, that want to match at these events. That's what's different. But, you know, I mean, I, I guess – I guess it's ridiculous that our our Ryder Cup and Presidents Cups team teams do this, but you know, God forbid, Pat <laughs> happened to match somebody. So, I, being the mental midget that you are, I'm just not going to make it happen. I think you should wear the Azalea shirt on Friday, and I will not. And then I will wear the Azalea shirt on Saturday, and you can wear whatever makes you happy. Well, if that's the compromise. We can do that. All right, I'm excited about it. You guys need to make sure you follow along on social. It's always electric. Always electric. Yeah, it's going to be good. <clears throat> Pat, um, you know, I do need to remind the people. Actually, we've had a couple of people ask us uh, about this lately. We've been talking about the franchise program through Elite Events and Tickets, and uh, we've had a couple of people already, you know, kind of add to – the uh, the value of us talking about it because they they've really uh, elite events and tickets has had some tremendous success already with some franchisees coming right out of tour junkie so you know like hey look like one of these days maybe ten years from now you got some one of you guys is like a millionaire and it's all because you listen to our stupid show and not because you won a million dollars in DFS it's because you won a million dollars listening to an ad read of ours that made you a franchisee and you crushed it. And now you're a millionaire. So I think that's I think that's a really cool thing. We know and trust the guys at EliteEventsAndTickets.com. They are your stop for concerts, sporting events, uh, festivals, anything you want to go to, shows, anything that's got a ticket, basically. Elite Events and Tickets can hook you up. We know them personally. We've known them over a decade. They're trustworthy folks. These are not your, you know, underground sh- ticket broker people. Uh, they're fair, and they're offering a franchisee program. Just started offering it here in 2019, but they've got a proven track record, uh, proven program that's going to make this thing work for you. They give you the software. They give you the program, the training, both initially and ongoing. You have them to lean back and fall back on, and you can run your own Elite Events and Tickets franchise from your hizzy. It's pretty cool. So you can reach out to our friends at Elite Events and Tickets. Uh, go to Elite Events and Tickets franchise. 
It is a long URL. Elite Very Events long. and Tickets Franchise dot com. Elite Events and Tickets Franchise dot com. And tell them the tour junkies sent you. Inquire. It doesn't. It doesn't. It doesn't. You know, hold you to anything. You can just inquire and be like, eh, no, I'm out. But it'd be pretty cool if it worked out. We've already we've already heard some good stories of some TJ listeners uh, kind of getting deep in the process of being uh, franchise owners. So very cool. And we appreciate them sponsoring the podcast. And with that, Pat, uh, we've got an, uh, not a new course, but new in the last few years, hosting the RBC Canadian Open. Uh, so I know you want to tell us about Hamilton, not uh, the Broadway show. Alexander Hamilton. Hamilton. But about the I've never course. seen have you seen that? I have uh I've I've actually listened to a fair amount of the soundtrack. I've never the soundtrack's pretty good. Ooh, that's I another listen. thing. That's another thing. We've got a playlist on Apple Music for our it's our member guest playlist. It's absolutely full of heaters. Uh and you can go subscribe to that and, and look it up. It's called the Boom B O M E playlist just google bone you didn't like you must not have liked my suggestion for that i did not like your suggestion in fact i listened to it last night and i was like what was pat saying that song is (laughs) i like i mean it's a it's a it's a nice song the the story is nice but it is not i'm like what if i'm standing over if i'm standing over a tee shot and this song comes on i don't know whether to hit the ball or cry it was actually it was actually given to me by by 2.0 and i listened to it the first time on the boat terrible and I thought I was like, this is a great boat song. But then when I started listening to it more, I was like, nah, this probably isn't a good golf song. It's a fine boat song, but yeah. You, uh-huh. you guys need to get on Apple Music and check out the Boom playlist. I'll share it, courtesy of David Barnett. It'll be shared by David Barnett on Apple Music. It's mainly hip hop. So if you don't like hip hop, you're not gonna like it. It's mainly hip hop. It's got a a lot of country in it as well. It's got a little bit of Journey. Um, and then I'm waiting on Pat to give me a few suggestions, but if there's anything like that, I'm going to add to it this week. Gonna I'm going to add to it. I've and got, if you guys I've have any suggestions, yeah. if, guys, if the listeners have any suggestions, that'd be great too. I mean, we want this to be something that just lights our fire when we're on the golf course. I wouldn't so. mind if we added some some 90s stuff, like some Pearl Jam in there. Would really okay. love some of that. I'm good with some Pearl Jam. You um, give me some songs. Yeah. I'm good with that. I'm going to put some of that stuff in there. Um, I, you know what? I'd, I'd even love some widespread panic in there. Throw some panic. Be good. Yeah, I'm not. I wasn't. Um, I wasn't really a wide. I wasn't really a widespread guy. Yeah. Well, you're. You know. I, I wouldn't have pictured you honestly as a as a widespread guy. A little bit oh man, when I was in college, when I was in college at Georgia, that was a, that was a thing. Yeah. Best I, concert I, I've I, ever I, been to was Widespread Panic playing downtown Athens. I'm sure we have some listeners who who were maybe at that concert it was just the most incredible thing ever anyway so i got pretty drunk too by the way oh you don't say um all right while you while you do the chunk and run i need a refill um you still have not learned to have your own personal bar next to well your, i like to keep it cool your person so i want to keep it in the fridge and then you know i was going to get a i was going to put it in a big yeti that would last me the whole show but then i knew everybody would be pissing and moaning because they could hear the yeti aluminum ice rattling around on the microphone so I, see I try, what I do is I try I, to I keep it in Yeti, the plastic cup. I take the Yeti, fill it with ice with the vodka in it, not all the way to the top, but so so it keeps the vodka cold. But then I also can use the ice. So this is literally oh. like my own. So then and then it's got the top on it, so you can pour it out. The ice you just got the vodka there, and then uh, cup, you know, with the ice and my mixers. Everything's you're, right here. You're the Bryson DeChambeau of alcoholic uh, accessibility. It's very yeah. impressive. So, all right, you do all that. Right, well, let's I'll, talk about I'll, the Canadian right Open. Back. Excited for this course, actually. I like when we get a new course on tour. I, I say new. This, this, they have played this, the tournament here five times at Hamilton Golf and Country Club, but we have not seen it since 2012. The course is a great kind of classic design. Plays just under 7,000 yards. So, one of those shorter courses on tour that we'll get this year. Uh, it's playing as a par 70. As I mentioned, just a good old classic course. You got small greens, tight lines off the tee. One of the things I will say is that um, the last time they played it, they had a lot more trees along the fairways. So they've taken out a lot of these trees. They've opened it up a little bit, which could start to favor the Bombers. I think rough is going to be difficult. I definitely think this is a ball strikers course. You got to hit fairways and you got to hit greens. Very small greens, like I mentioned, so you've got to hit them in the right spots. 
Um, they're very undulating. I don't think they're going to be that quick because of the undulation. I think they're going to be, you know, decent speed, but not anything out of the norm. Uh, it kind of reminds me a little bit of what we saw just a couple of weeks ago at Colonial. Um, again, a course where you've got to just, you know, hit fairways, hit greens. You've got to be able to work the ball left and right. There are several dog legs off the tee here on this course. Um, so I think, you know, looking at guys who, you know, they're out there, they, they like to work, work the ball. They're hitting the greens in the right spot, in the right spots. Um, when you're looking at, you know, the par fives out here, there's two par fives. Both of them are gettable. I mean, number four is playing at 542. It's straightforward. Actually, both of these courses, very straightforward as far as both of these par fives. Just right off the tee. There's nothing really out of the ordinary. Number four does have water to the right of the green. But it's really not, I mean, if, for these guys that are going to go for it in two, that water is not in play. I mean, you really have to just just flare it off the tee for that to even be uh, an issue there. Uh, 17 is the other par five. It's playing at far, about 550. Again, another just really straightforward par five, one that they can hit. Um, there is a risk-reward hole out here. Um, you know, number five is playing probably about 320 to 340. So some of your longer hitters, your Brits Kepkas, your DJs, may go after number five and try to reach that green uh, off the tee, which they can do. Um, but I'm going to keep it pretty simple again this week. I think, you know, I'm going to look at form. I'm going to look at ball striking. I'm going to look at strokes gained approach, scrambling. Whenever, like I mentioned, you know, we've had small greens lately with Colonial, Memorial, and now here. I think I actually think, you know, Muirfield Village is a very comparable course, except for the length, because it's much longer than this one. But as far as going into the greens, you're going to have to be a good scrambler out here with the rough uh, and things like that. Looking at past champs, I mean, it really doesn't matter all that much, uh, because uh, like the last four were at Glen Abbey. Um, but DJ did win last year. Johnny Vegas had two wins in a row. Then he had Jason Day in 2015. The last two champs here, though, were Scott Piercy in 2012. Playing good right now. Could be an interesting play. And then Jim Furyk, another guy that's playing really well. He won in 2006. Uh, a couple notes, I will say, we're back to a, a larger field. We've had invitationals the last couple tournaments. So about 120, 122 players. This week we're going to get 156 players. Uh, so back to really to a full field event. We'll have even more next week for the U.S. Open. But there you go. That is Hamilton Golf and Country Club. Looking, looking forward to seeing this course. It's, it's one, I don't know if I really remember 2012 um, all that much. So, I, so. I don't remember May 12th. I, I have a horrible memory. Um, so there you go. Speaking of the U.S. Open, had the, had the sectional qualifiers today. A lot of guys qualifying. Mm. Handful of them in this field this week. Um, handful of them in this field that didn't qualify. Really hated to see Joel Damon not qualify today. Missed it by a shot for the second year in a row. Well, huh. he's not in the field though. No, I know he's just a buddy. He's just, he's just we're just a fan. Yeah. Of no, I hate I hated that. By the way, he was in the field, but last week with Drew. Drew. Um, you know, in terms of Hamilton, man, I I, I think it's I think it's wide open. I, I don't. I think it's a short hitter. I think it's a bomber. I think it's I think it could be any of those. Um. You look at obviously it's a par seventy, so I weighted par four scoring with uh, you know a higher percentage of these holes being par fours, and a lot of them are shorter par fours, uh, you know by PGA Tour standards. This is a pretty short course, um, like you said. The par fives both reachable, both gettable. You know if you're new to this, definitely a different course than the one DJ has dominated the past couple years. Um, uh -huh. So DJ is going to have to club down a little bit. Uh, guys like that are going to have to club down a little bit here at Hamilton. Um, I, you know, I, I'm, I'm waiting fairways gained. I'm waiting opportunities gained. Both of those stats proprietary to fantasy national golf club.com fantasy national.com, um, fairways gained. just talking about, you know, it's different than, it's different than driving accuracy or strokes gained off the tee as it's compared relative to the field that they played in. So I'm looking at fairways gained guys who are hitting fairways, uh, versus, you know, where they stack up in the field. And opportunities gained, <clears throat> another proprietary stat that just tells you how many times a guy hits it within 15 feet for birdie or eagle, uh, 15 feet of the hole um, in you know in regulation or less. Guys who are just dialed in with their irons. Uh, both of those proprietary to Fantasy National. You can join Fantasy National 
uh, by going to fantasynational.com slash TJ. Fantasynational.com slash TJ. Get 20% off your subscription. 20% off your month, your weekly, monthly, or annual subscription. That's our number one stat engine lineup generator tool, all that fun stuff. Um, I looked at strokes gained approach, and um, what else did I look at? I think that's it's just it's just hitting it in the fairway and iron play. Uh, actually, you know what I did? I looked at um, par four scoring over the last 100 rounds. I decided to really expand the number of rounds I'm looking at there. With all the other stats, I looked at more recent stuff, like the last 24 rounds. Um, but with par four scoring, I, I wanted to get a bigger picture, like long term, who's who scores well on par fours and par seventy type courses consistently. Um, and so I looked at the last hundred rounds over on Fantasy National for that. Obviously, course history is a thing, um, you know. But out here this week, it really you really don't have a lot of course history to work off of because the last time they played it was twenty twelve, and I just don't know that it's really relative. This week. Uh, yeah, I didn't even I didn't um, even look at it at all. Not relative relevant. Yeah, um, it's just not worth to me. This is one of those rare weeks where it's not really worth looking at. You can look back at 2012 and see who played well, but it is probably not worth the noise if you ask me. Uh, so it, it's it's an interesting week. It's like a little more of a gut feel week. It's a little more of a you know who do I feel good about? Um, who where's the ownership going? If you're playing in in DFS or in tournaments. Um, it, I, I don't, unlike last week, I don't really see, in terms of DFS, I don't really see a lot of guys in the 6K that I like. Last week, there was a lot of guys in the 6K that I like. I don't really find that to be the case this week. There's a couple, and I don't even feel great about them. Um, so I could see myself rolling with a little more balanced approach in terms of DFS. Now, in terms of outright betting, there are a few long shots that I like. I just don't want to play them in DFS. Um, so we, we'll get to those, obviously, as they come along. But let's start off uh, 9K and above. We're going to roll off of DraftKings pricing. 9K and above, we're going to give you three GPP plays that we like, a cash play, and a fade. Oh, <clears throat> Pat, I will start. Um, I am going to play Matt Kuchar. I'm, I, I don't like him, <clears throat> uh, but I said I'd play him. Um I'm going to play Matt Kuchar coming off the missed cut. He, he just checks every single box I mentioned. He's fifth in the field in the long-term par-4 scoring. Um, he's, he's got a great history in the RBC Canadian, but obviously, again, this course is, uh, had, hadn't been seen since 2012. But I like being able to jump on Kuchar where he may have a little lower ownership than, we, than we're used to seeing him um, after a, an abysmal missed cut um, and, and then, you know, I don't know. I'm just hoping that's the case. Maybe it's not, but he's as high as I really care to go this week. Um, I'll go ahead and say a DJ is a fade is my fade in this range. Um, just because I can't, and it's not because I don't really like him. It's because for the value and the price on DraftKings at 11.9, I, I cannot find enough low 6K guys and low 7K guys that I like my lineup construction with that, knowing that. Also, because I'm paying that much for him, I really need DJ. You know, I really need him top five or better, um, which he could definitely do. I, I'm not saying I don't like him in terms of how he'll perform, but yeah. maybe you know, if you if you, yeah. So I, I just I can't. It's just a, it, from a DFS perspective, it's a pure lineup construction fade for me. Uh, so I'm gonna go Cooch at ten thousand five. I'm gonna go uh, Webb Simpson at ninety seven. I really like Webb this week. Uh, He's had a good year, solid year. He struggled a little bit with the irons, um, but I'm, 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 I feel like he's going to get that worked out. It's a great course for him. Great little, you know, great little tune-up before the U.S. Open. Second in the field in over the last hundred rounds in par four scoring. He always plays really well on par fours. Deadly accurate off the tee. Don't see him getting in a lot of trouble. Uh, so I feel like he's a really good value at 97. I, I feel like he's got as much upside, uh, or not as much upside, but I think he fits this course as good as anyone priced above him, maybe other than Matt Kuchar. Uh, so I love yeah. Webb Simpson here. And then finally, I am going to go to the the, the champ uh, that that won the last time this event was played here. Scott Piercy at 9300 on DraftKings. Originally, when I saw the price, it's like, yeah, I don't know if I want to pay 9300 for Scott. But when you really dig in and see just, I mean, we, and we've been on Scott a few weeks here, but he's playing really, really solid right now. Um 
always a good ball striker, pretty steady. I don't see a, a lot of opportunities for him to like make big numbers and really crap the bed here at this golf course. Um, wind can be a factor here. We didn't really talk about the weather, but wind can be at play here, uh, especially having eliminated a lot of the trees that they have, and he's a, he's a pretty decent wind player. So those are my three GPPs, Cooch, Webb, Scott Piercy. My cash play is Webb. I feel as good about Webb as anybody in this field, and I like the, the, the 9K starting point for cash. And then the fade is DJ. Cheers. Well, okay. Well, we've got some agreement here because uh, I'll, I'll get it out of the way. My cash play and GPP, one of them is Webb Simpson. I love him. Um, so I'm totally with you there for all the reasons you said. So I think that uh, you, you can definitely lock in Webb this week. It's just a perfect course for him. It really is. So um, I like that. And, you know, we really haven't seen a lot from him lately. And so uh, you might get a little bit lower ownership. So I don't we'll, we'll think see what happen. happens. There. I think he's going to be you pretty don't, popular. No. You think he'll be pretty chalky? I yeah. would love it if he did, but we'll see what Panshare says. Um, as far as other GPP plays besides Webb, I like Henrik Stenson down at the bottom there at 9,100. He's a guy that I've just kind of been on steadily lately. I mean, he's just cut. His game is coming around. I mean, you look at the stats. He's number five in ball striking. Number one in strokes came to approach. You mentioned fairways gained. He's sixth in the field as far as that stat's concerned. Um, you know, he's 12th in the field in par four scoring. I just think Stenson, and this is another good course for him. I mean, a, a, just a course where you've, you've got to hit fairways, got to hit greens in the right spot. I think he can do that. So I like Stenson as a good, maybe low on GPP play. We'll see there. And then up top, I think there really is going to be some struggle between your guy, Cooch, JT, and Rory. I think that's kind of a, a, a little bit of a of a hot spot there. And maybe some guys, are, folks are going to look at, you know, who are they going to choose right there? And I like Rory. You know, I think this could be a course that he could just eat alive with his distance. You know, he's, he's definitely, I mean, off the tee, he's number one in the field. He's seventh in greens and regulation. He's fourth in approach, first in ball striking. You know, I just think Rory could have definite lower ownership than you might typically see for him coming off a missed cut. He's really just been average this year. But you saw him at a course like, you know, the Players' Championship where he just absolutely played incredible. And I think you could see that again this week. So I like Rory's GPP play. I think he's – and you know what? I don't mind that price at all. I think that's just about right. And I'm with you on DJ. I'm going to fade DJ because of the exact same reason. I just don't feel like I'm fitting in a good um, tournament team – GPP team with some DJ in there. At least I got a little more room with a guy like Rory. So, so there you go. Rory is going to be one of my GPP plays. Also, Henrik Stenson, Webb in cash and GPP, and DJ will be the fade. Okay. So yeah, yeah, good bit of agreement there. And I got to say, I don't hate your other. I don't hate the other two GPP plays. Um, Rory, uh, I don't mind spinning up. I mean, I don't like spinning up, but maybe if there's a little, uh, little, little ownership leverage there, he's obviously a powerhouse. Um, all right, let's get down to the 8K range on DraftKings, and also uh, we start with a couple guys, or at least one guy that I'm going to have some bets on when we talk about the sportsbook side of things. Um, $8,800. I've been on him all year. I love me some old man Jim Furyk. I, I love, yeah. I love Jim Furyk here. Former winner here playing really well as good as he's played in a lot of years right now checks all the boxes for me um eight over the last 100 rounds in strokes gain par four uh hits fairways like no other the irons are dialed in i love the price at 8800 he is also likely going to be chalky in terms of tournaments but I, i'm eating it uh he's at 45 to one over on mybookie.ag i think that's a, a really great number for Furyk, um, I, you, know, you guys know, I mean, if you followed us for any length of time, we're not big fans on giving you, uh, at least I'm not, Pat's really not either, on giving you super short odds guys to, to win golf tournaments. You know, those guys you can figure out on your own. I mean, if you didn't see Patrick Cantlay coming last week, I don't know what you're looking at. If you're interested in betting shorter odds guys in golf, that's fine. I, I, I just, golf is so variable. I love kind of starting in the more, you know, high 30s, you know, 30-something to one and, and higher. Um, 
just because of how variable it can be. And typically, it's not hard for for a listener to to pick out who may be a a shorter odd guy who could pop. But I think Furyk at forty five to one is criminally undervalued. Um, I mean, I, I'd I'd rather have Furyk. I'd rather have Furyk than Bubba then um, probably even as much as I like Piercy, I, I probably, I think Furyk, I might rather have him over, over Piercy. Um, like, what, here, here's, a, here's an interesting question for you. Justin Thomas. Now, in any other scenario, it, at any other time of the year, without an injury, uh, without coming off an abysmal Friday afternoon that he had at Memorial, if you were the odds maker... How close would you make the odds f- with Furyk and Justin Thomas? Because I think they're, I think considering the state of JT's, you know, we, we said that last week was going to be a warm up week for him. You know, we, we I, or I did. I said you should fade Justin Thomas. We knew that last week was kind of shaking the rust off, um, which maybe he did. But I think the odds should be closer. I think, I think. Given JT's pedigree, his odds should probably be shorter, but I think that his odds should be closer to Furyk than they are right now. And I think Furyk's undervalued. Does that make any sense? Or is that the vodka talking? I'm not really sure. <laughs> yeah, I mean, it makes sense. Um, I don't know. Yeah, I mean, what are the odds? Have you Did you say them? Well, no, no. Uh, Furyk forty-five to one, and JT. I'm looking on. I'm looking on mybookie.ag. Probably um, fifteen to one. JT is sixteen to one. I mean, I just think okay. it's more than twice the odds of Furyk right now, given the injury and the Friday performance. If you're talking about odds to win, to win the golf tournament, I mean, I, I feel like my money's safer a lot. You know, safer with Jim Furyk right now. I yeah, like, no, I, I agree with that. I like the way he sets up here. Uh, so I'm yeah. going to go with Furyk and GPP. That's enough enough time on him. Uh, and then in terms of DraftKings, I'm going to go Ryan Palmer at 8,200. Uh, playing really well and plays good on tracks like this. Plays good on you know more traditional, old-school tracks. Likes to work the golf ball. Played well at Colonial. We just saw him playing at Colonial a couple weeks ago. Now I know that's a home, that's a home event for him, um, but finished, finished sixth. Um, there gained a ton of strokes t to green gained eight strokes t to green um i I just i like the ball striking ability of ryan palmer and and it's been pretty good here lately so i'm gonna go with palmer and gpps and then furic is my cash play if you hadn't already figured that out based on my love my my five minute love fest on jim furic and then i'm gonna fade the canadian adam hadwin i'm fading adam hadwin he's just you know this is a course built for adam hadwin so, you know, if on Wednesday night you're like, hey, FanshareSports.com has Adam Hadwin projected at like 5%, which I don't think is going to happen because he's Canadian and people are going to want to play him. But if you were to tell me that and say, like, should I play him, I'd probably be like, okay, if you want to play him, that's fine. Because this should be a golf course that Adam Hadwin plays really well at. This, this, for 2018, Adam Hadwin would be crushing this golf course. But 2019 Adam Hadwin has not been very good. Um, the ball striking's not there like it has been historically. His iron play has been very poor uh, lately uh, in 2019, is what I mean, uh, and even the tail end of 2018. So I, I just I'm not I'm not feeling the Canadian. I feel like he's getting a little bump in price, and I feel like he's going to get a little bump in ownership, all because he's the Canadian, and this you know this should feel like a good event for him. That also may add extra pressure on Adam Hadwin. So I think he's the fade. At 8,300, I apologize to the Canadians for that take. Mm. And then, Poor, uh, yeah, that's my that's my 8K range. Well, I'm actually with you on Hadwin. I, he's not my fave, but I, I was kind of tinkering between him and who I am going to fade. But um, I also will say Furyk was my cash play. I did want to give a couple more GPP plays outside of Furyk. I think you could play him both in GPPs and cash, but he was my cash play. So I'm, I'm with you there totally. I mean, just just in great form, perfect for this course, and obviously has won it on this course before. So, um, 
But I like Bubba this week at 8,900. You know, I know this is a course that's shorter, and everybody tends to look at Bubba and they 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 see his length and everything off the tee and whatever else. But I think he can play well in this course. He likes to work the ball left and right. He likes to you know where whatever it is, he likes to to kind of see the shots you know in his mind. And I think this is one of those courses where you have to do that. Um, so it's a little bit more of a feel type play with Bubba, but I just feel like he's going to have a good week. But, you know, he does have the stats to back it up. I mean, he's ninth in the field in ball striking. He's second off the tee, obviously, but he's, he's scrambling the ball right now. You got you to gotta do well here on, that, on this course as far as that's concerned. And he's going to be low owned. I mean, I, I just don't, I don't think a whole lot of people are going to be on Bubba this week. Um, I could be wrong. I mean, that's the worst thing about this YouTube thing, by the way, is like I, like, I get to actually look at your face when I say something. And I'm like, what is the hell what is are, he? What are you picking up? Like on you my just face had this right like, now? like you. I don't. I think you, like you. You. I. I, I kind of picked up on like, maybe you thought he wasn't a good scrambler or something. I don't know. You did. There was something I just said that you. Well, you reacted yeah. to that. I was no, like, no. Actually, ah. actually, you know, this is the thing. If you're listening to us on the podcast, that's we we appreciate it all the time. But I gotta say, right now, for the early adopters of watching us on YouTube do this show live, props to them. And, and they're being interactive. And the fun thing about this for me is that you can't see the production of the YouTube live broadcast. Uh, I can't live see as anything. It's, as it's happening. Yeah. I can. And I so really what's fun it. is <laughs> I, I, can, I, I am seeing the comments of the people on YouTube live as they're happening. And then I can even throw a comment up on the screen uh, for, the, for the, the, the viewers to see while you're talking and and believe it or not so everybody needs to know this is very one-sided when you're watching this on <laughs> yeah on but YouTube. it's a, it's a technology so. gap it's not because i can't it's not because it i'm in can't you share your screen one-sided. so i can see what's no, what the I, hell's going on no it's part of this production software that we're using I, only the producer which is moi uh can can see what's happening now all right can, so i'm gonna suggest uh, anybody out there that wants to be a tour junkies producer <laughs> That will can can learn how to uh, let me see what actually is going on when this this on here's, this YouTube well, crap. Well, here's the thing. Believe it but, or not, you were not being made fun of. Uh, it was actually a rather timely take on Bubba because we had just gotten a question from Alan Lyon, who's watching on YouTube. Any thoughts on Bubba? And so all I did was throw Alan's question on the screen that just said any thoughts on Bubba as you were talking about Bubba. That's really all that was happening. So good for you. Okay. All right, Good. so continue right. with the rest. So of those the are my thoughts on Bubba. I like Bubba this week. Okay. I think he, I think he's a good GPP play. So there you go. Um, also, a guy that I've been on recently. I know you've been kind of you've been questioning this, but he keeps coming through time and time again over the last few weeks, and that's Jason Duffner. I mean, the guy is just Ugh. he's checking boxes. No, I can't. He's he is eleventh in the field in ball striking, thirteenth in strokes gained approach. Ninth in driving accuracy, which is fairways gained on Fantasy National. He's, um, you know, checks the box off the tee, 22nd in the field. He's 19th in par four scoring. I mean, the guy is just, he's very solid right now. I mean, he had a seventh place finish last week at the Memorial. You know, had a T4 at Wells Fargo, which I think is a very comparable course also outside of Muirfield Village. At where, Wells Fargo? Like, you think Quail Hollow is comparable to this place? From a standpoint, off not off the tee, but for, from an approach standpoint, I think it is. I think it's one of those courses where you got to hit greens, you got to you got to scramble well. well all, yeah, you, you have to do, do all that every things. golf course. I, I think, but you got to do that. You got to do what he, what Jason Duffner's doing well every single week. This is one of those courses. I, I like that. It's not a bomber's course, which well, is yeah, where yeah, Duffner is. You have to hit your irons every week, typically on a PJ Tour event. I think it's a. a the Wells Fargo is a horrible course comparison to this place. I vehemently no, I think it disagree is. with you. I think I I actually disagree it's a terrible because it's, there's the rough was the rough was what how was the rough at Wells Fargo? Pretty high, right? Rough around the greens was pretty tough, not easy. I think it is a very it, it's definitely. I think Wells Fargo was actually a, a great course com, comparable to last week's tournament. I think this proves what you said in the beginning of the podcast that you're going to get on the uh, planet Tito. You're going to arrive to Planet Tito's early in the podcast. I think clearly you're there. Clearly you're there. Anyway, go What's ahead. the difference? What's the biggest difference? Like, why is it? Why is there a it's huge just, difference? It's just a, a much longer And don't bring course. up length. I don't want to hear length. Don't tell me length. 
Okay. Tell me something outside of length. Why it's totally. You can't different. say that the course is comparable just because they have to hit irons into greens. Yeah. So I you have to do that on every have, course. Everybody, everybody hits irons into greens. What the fuck are you talking about? Whoa, whoa, whoa! We're trying to keep this a family friendly show, buddy. We're trying to keep this a family friendly show. I'm bomb, just saying man. it's a ball strikers type course where you can't you can't miss greens. You got to hit fairways, which you have to do at the Wells Fargo, which at Quail Hollow. You have to do at Muirfield Village. You can't just get away with missing the fairways. It, it's it's a ball strikers course. You got to hit the fairways. Got to hit the greens. Okay. For the sake so of time, you, we shall move on. What is your, I, don't, I don't understand. I what actually your point don't is. hate the Jason Duffner play now, and you're right. You have been on him, and I have not been able to pull the trigger. But um, I just don't. I don't buy into that. Quail Hollow is a comparable golf course for the reasons. I don't that understand. You stated. But why not? That's what I'm trying to figure out. Why not? I mean, by your logic, any golf course is comparable if you have to hit greens and you have to be in the fairway. Like, great. Like. I don't even think. I don't even think. But I, what I'm saying is, what I'm saying is, the is, length it's does more matter penal, because it's more it means you have longer tee, approaches. It's more penal off the tee in in both of these. It's more pe- penal off the tee at Muirfield Village. We saw that. It's the same way at Quail Hollow, and it's more penal if you miss the greens. So what I'm saying, because because there are a lot of courses out there where that doesn't even really matter. You can you can hit it all over the freaking place. So that's what I'm saying is it's you know, and they have a classic design to them too where. You know, you got to work the ball off the tee. It's not everything straightforward. That's what I'm talking about when I'm when I'm trying to compare courses. I'm saying as far as the eye for guys that are playing those courses, it's a little bit different. We're not at the Byron Nelson where you just freaking bomb it away. It doesn't matter if you miss a fairway. It doesn't matter really if you miss a green. I mean, you want to hit. The, everybody wants to hit the greens. I'm not saying that, but it's not as penal where it is at Quail Hollow, and it is at Muirfield Village if you are missing those greens. So if you're checking the box. When it comes to ball striking, meaning you're hitting those fairways, you're hitting greens, you're not. You're going to give yourself more chances on average. That's what I'm saying. Okay. That's my point as to why it's more. I'm not. I'm not saying they are the exact same courses. Of course, they're not the exact same courses. But if a guy's played well on those two courses, then yeah, I'm going to take that into a, 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 you know into an account. You're okay. speechless because <laughs> I. Freaking made a good point. Will you finish? Will you finish the AK range, please? <laughs> I'm fading King and uh, Bradley, and only because if, since I've already cussed, he's just a fucking asshole, and I'm not playing oh, him anyway. Oh sh- crap! <laughs> Somebody just said on YouTube, both courses have green grass. <laughs> <laughs> Jason Miles, well played. Both courses have green grass. That is good. Um, <laughs> I'm so confused now. Have you have you mentioned all of your picks for the 8K cash fade? I have, that? but I will say this: your Keegan radar. You said you had a great great Keegan uh, radar, but it did not. Uh, it did not turn out last it was, week. It was and brutal. I'm just I'm just not gonna play them. All right, while so. you're while you're uh, all all hot and bothered, why don't you start off the 7K range? All right, so here we go. Dear God, get us through the picks on the RBC Canadian. I oh, this is this is I forgot. This one's going to get even better for you uh, now that we're in the 7K range. So I'm going to start with uh, a little Eric Van Royen. He's been, you know, he's EBR. Been, he's been, mm-hmm. EBR. He's been popping for me. You know, mm-hmm. checks the box. He's ninth in the field in par four scoring. Um, ugh, lost my spot. Where the hell am I? Um, uh, you got me all confused now. Um, <laughs> what else about this dude? Oh, yeah. So he's 15th in ball he's striking. South African. Third, yeah, South African, whatever that means. 31st that means he's from he's South Africa. Approach. Pat. Literally means he's from South Africa. I know. What I do you mean like whatever, whatever that means? That, I meant like whatever that means as far as the why you would play him. I don't think that really matters as to why you would play freaking Eric Van Ruyen. But I appreciate the info. Good for you. Um, the can- Canadian that I will go with is uh, Corey Connors. I do like him this yeah. week at 7,500. I think that's a great play. Um, look, and, and the guy's been – if you're going to pick a Canadian this week, just go with Connors. You know, he's got to win this this year. Um, great iron definitely, player. Yes, fantastic Elite iron player. Iron we, player. we know yeah. irons matter. you got to actually hit irons into these greens. Irons matter. Um, you're not hitting putter into the greens. So you want to go with those those good iron players. 
yep. um, as you mentioned earlier. Um, so I like him. And you know who I really like, and I'm going to play, and I'm bringing him back, back to the show, Jonas Mother Effin' Blix. <laughs> Woo! Yes! Uh. Yes! Jonas Blix at 7,800. Checking boxes for me in ball striking. He's 22nd in the field. 15th in driving accuracy. You like that? I want an argument as to why you can't play Blix. 26 off the tee. 29th in greens and regulation. He's made 12 of 18 cuts this year with four top 20 finishes. Played extremely well from the start last week or a couple weeks ago at the Colonial and kind of faltered a little bit over the weekend. But he still had a fifth place finish so i like some jonas blicks i think he's uh actually in play for the one time that i will mention his name in freaking years um but he's got his game back together and we've seen it okay who's your cash play out of that group or out of who are you playing cash actually of those three i'm not playing him in cash i think kh lee is a good cash play at 7400 yeah. i mean he's a guy he's just been, i mean if, if you're looking at solid guys he's made 10 of his last 11 cuts 25th in ball striking, 32nd in ac driving accuracy, 13th off the tee. So, look, the guy's just been extremely solid. You can play him in tournaments as well, but I think for cash, he is as solid as they come in this range. All right, what about fades? Fade, I'm, I'm, I just, I'm going easy here. J.B. Holmes, just terrible form and whatever Jamie else. And Holmes. I just, I don't, I can't. You got, you got to have two fades in this range. Who's your other one? Hmm. You're, by the way, uh, oh, your uh, your Jonas Sanjay. Blix your Jonas Blix howl is getting a lot of uh, a lot of love on on YouTube right now. <laughs> Sunjay M, by the way, is my other fate at seventy nine hundred. I, I forgot to mention him. Just, I okay. mean, is he gonna play a thousand tournaments? I mean, <laughs> the the strokes the, bled grinding is is in play here for this guy. I mean, he there's only forty eight like, tournaments on the PJ Tour every year, and Sunjay M is playing all fifty three of them. Um, yes, the dude and is, he's not really in the in yeah. the greatest of form to pay seventy nine hundred for him. I mean, he's missed three of his last six cuts, and even when he has made the cut lately, he's not really doing all that much. So I just I'm not I'm not playing him this week. Well, this should be quite the electric seven K range. Uh, first of all, while we're on topic, I am also fading Sung J M. I said the same thing. He's definitely he's definitely fallen off. I mean, he was he was everybody's favorite. Uh, but at 7,900, I don't think you can play him given the recent form. It's kind of tough to pull the trigger on. Uh, another, while we're on the topic of fades, uh, I feel like it's kind of a bold fade because he's only $7,600. He's making cuts. He's an RBC guy. The course should fit him. But I think Graham McDowell is, is, is actually a fade right now. When you look over those key stats that I mentioned, he actually checks none of the boxes. He comes close to checking the par four scoring box, but I mean, really since April, he's done nothing, uh, nothing at all. Um, except lose a lot of strokes off the tee and approach and around the green. Um, he's, he's been pretty abysmal. So I think Graham McDowell, although yes, I see him as a cut maker. If you, if you're trying to win a tournament, you need more than that at a G Mac. And I could see him being a little more popular play down here. I, I liked your Corey Connors call. I'd much rather have Connors. Um, in this range, so uh, I'm out on him. Uh, I I like I like Nick Watney. Uh, Watney is my cash play. He is also a GPP play for me. Um, I just like where he's. I, I don't know. I, I kind of like I like the iron ability right now. He's he's always you know fairly low owned. He's had a good couple of tournaments here at both at Colonial and uh, I'm sorry not Colonial Charles Schwab and Memorial. Um, he's played pretty well, gaining strokes uh, with his irons, a lot of strokes with his irons, actually. If the putter is just average, Nick Watney could, could give you a top 15, top 20, no problemo. So he's my cash play. He's one of my GPP plays. You know, because we feel like we got to pick some Canadians here. You know, you said Corey Connors. I'll give you Mackenzie Hughes. I mean, 7500 bucks. It feels a little pricey for Mackenzie Hughes, but everybody feels a little pricey for McK Mackenzie Hughes. Uh, but what a great event he played a couple weeks ago at the Charles Schwab. Um, yeah, that was Colonial. What am I thinking? That was Colonial. Uh, you know, gained five strokes, tee to green. He's putting well. Um, I, I just, you know, he's not a long hitter, but he's fairly accurate. So I think Mackenzie Hughes is maybe your less chalky Canadian in this range. Um, 
because I think he's interesting. But my, my last GPP play is, is an interesting play, I think. I think you'll be interested in this one. Over the last 100 rounds, this golfer is 18th in strokes gained par fours. Okay, so ga gaining strokes on par fours. He checks the box in driving accuracy, fairways gained. Uh, relative to his price, he's actually pretty good in strokes gained approach. He's not fantastic, but he's pretty good in strokes gained approach. And he's in pretty good form, and he's making cuts. And this is now the second time in a four-year Tour Junkies history that I will be playing one Jonas Blixt, who I already had written down. <sighs> and actually, I believe it's the second time this year. You know, for 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 T TJ listeners who are new, uh, who were not around in year one, I have a major grudge against Jonas Blix that that Huge that grudge. dates back to 2015, and I basically vowed that it will take a lot for me to play Jonas Blix from that day forward. And in the last four years, this will be the second time I have mentioned Jonas Blix as a play on the podcast, uh, and both have come this season. But I have to agree with you. I feel like the game's coming around. I feel like he's playing pretty good. We've got we've got a, a longtime listener, Bob Gilchrist, on YouTube right now that says, I am floored. So for those of you who know, like I'm just telling you, DB is not a Jonas Blix fan. Um, and it takes a lot for me to say it, but I, I mentioned at the top of this podcast that I feel like there's not a lot of great options in the 6K range. You got to have some guys in the 7K range, and I think Jonas is. It's like it's like uh, it's like just the lesser of evils at this point. So I'm, I'm going Jonas Blix. Thoughts, Pat? You speechless? I'm just, I'm just so happy, and I'm ready to move on to the 6K range so we can get. 6K range, I got two guys. I think Hank Lebiota, we just had him on the podcast. If you haven't listened to Hank Lebiota, the, the interview that we did with Hank, I, I wish you would. It was a fantastic interview. He was an easy interview, very outspoken, very cool guy, uh, gave us a ton of great content, and he's been playing really well. Now, he's a long hitter, and this course isn't perfect for him, but he can make birdies, and it's a weak field, and he's still at 6,700. It's like it's like everybody else moved up in price, but Hank Lebiota kind of stayed the same. And I just feel like from a birdie making value, if you can get Hank through the cut, I bet he he I bet his DraftKings return is higher than than maybe where he may finish in the golf tournament. Um, I I'm also gonna go just I'm just gonna go with Johnson Wagner. It feels like a Johnson Wagner course. He's got a good history at the RBC Canadian, even though it's a slightly different golf course here with uh, with Hamilton. But I think I think Johnson Wagner just every now and then he pops, and when he does, he pops on a course like this one. So I, I guess I'll I guess I I will mention him. But he does check the box in par four scoring. But other than that, I just don't love a lot of the six K range. I really don't. That's yeah, it. Yeah, I'm I'm with you. I'm not a huge fan of this range as well. I think this is. Um... I don't know. There's just not a lot of ton of ton of guys here. Um, I mean, even you look at a guy like you know a Sam Saunders who was at 6,600. He's missed like three straight cuts. He may miss more than that, but played. But you were talking about the U.S. Open qualifiers. Yeah, lit he it shot up like 1,200 today. Just lit it up. Yeah. So I mean, That's this is a range to think about. That, that's definitely varies for sure, but. I'm with you on Hank Lebiota, who's one of the guys I had. I think that, yeah, you're right. I mean, his price should be a little bit higher. But, you know, he checks boxes too. But, he's, I mean, the the finishes haven't all been there. I think that's why his price is still cheap is because he's, yeah, he's playing well. Yeah, the finishes have not been great. Yeah, he's not yeah, putting four it, together. Yeah, and I think that's probably the issue with him. A, a guy, though, I would look at would be Nate Lashley at 6,700. Yeah. Um, he has played well this year. He's made nine of 11 cuts. So that, I mean, you got a guy in the 6,700 range that's missed only two cuts. I love that. He's 35th in ball striking. He's 14th in strokes gained approach. Pretty accurate off the tee as well. Um, you know, he's in the top third in the field when it comes to fairways gained. You know, so I think Nate Lashley is definitely a guy worth playing down here. Um, outside of that, that is, uh, that's all I got here in the 6K range. I'm actually glad you ended on Nate Lashley because I had him written down also as just a long shot my bookie bet at 250 to one. 
but I, I'm warming up to him in DFS. He actually qualified for the U.S. Open today at a golf course in Canada. So he qualified, in, uh, he qualified at Rattlesnake Point Golf Club, um, shot a four under over two days. Uh, the, the winner, actually, or the guy who finished first, along with our, our boy from UGA, Sepp Straka, was another guy that I think is worth a, you know, a very small, maybe a half unit, uh, if you're a betting man, on mybookie.ag. And Tom Hoagie, who finished five mm-hmm. under at Rattlesnake, um, and Tom's playing this week. He's at 250 to one on my bookie. I think, I think Tom and Nate Lashley, both just qualifying for the U.S. Open uh, in Canada, are worth a, a couple of long shot stabs at 250 to one, and also maybe you know maybe a top 20 bet or or something like that. And I actually forgot to mention a couple other my bookie bets. You mentioned Corey Connors. I mentioned Nick Watney. Both are at 80 to one on mybookie.ag, and then Mackenzie Hughes is 125 to one on mybookie.ag. If you've not already signed up for mybookie.ag, you can use promo code TOURJUNKIES, get you a 50% deposit bonus. And before we move on to the chunk and run, Pat, we've had some questions um, about Jonas Blix's ownership, which is interesting to me. And we always know that ownership has to be checked at fan, uh, fansharesports.com. That's where we go for ownership. I think it'll be interesting. I think Jonas might be a little... I think Jonas might be a little more popular this week. I think... I think because of your limited options in the lower parts of you know of the of the seven k and six k range, I think Jonas could be a little more a little more popular. He's not gonna he's not gonna knock your socks off, you know. Um, but I, I think it's interesting. We'll just have to check Fanshare. So uh, if you're not already a member at FanshareSports.com, you can join again promo code Tour Junkies and get twenty percent off that membership. But I, I mean, I could see Blix creeping that like seven to ten percent range. So, I mean, not too chalky to avoid him, but yeah, you know, you're not going to get him at like. I don't think you're going to get him less than five percent. I think people will play him. I think he's been consistent. Yeah, he's I checking agree. the boxes. I think people will play him. I don't think he's going to be as sneaky as uh, as we may as we may believe here on Monday night. Any other thoughts before we get to the chunk and run? No, nah, I'm good. All right. Pat, uh, the chunk portion of tonight's show is thoughts on the Hank Haney situation. Uh, for those of you living mm-hmm. under a rock, Hank Haney, former instructor to Tiger Woods, has his own golf show on, well, had his own golf show on Sirius XM PGA Tour Radio. Uh, he is now suspended from PGA Tour Sirius XM Radio. Well, I guess we'll find out for how long. Uh, based on his comments this week about the ladies U.S. Open, uh, which was held right down the street from us in Charleston, South Carolina, a lovely country club of Charleston, um, and I don't I don't have the quote in front of me. I'm not going to read it, um, but basically, uh, Hank uh, <laughs> Hank basically ag- admitted that he a doesn't really watch women's golf or know a lot about women's golf. Uh, B, didn't even know where they were playing this week. Uh, C, said that he couldn't name probably six players in the field. I think he mentioned Lexi and Michelle Wee, and then uh, really just was not in the field, actually. Yeah, and then basically just uh, then said, if I had to pick a winner, I would say some girl from Korea, probably last name Lee would be a good guess. Uh, And that was his winning prediction, jokingly, uh, on, well, as he laughed on the uh, XM radio broadcast. He then got called out by Michelle Wee, by a lot of people on Twitter and on social media, uh, got a ton of backlash, apologized, one of those apologies that we all see come uh, when something like this happens, was suspended by SiriusXM, and then proceeded to double down on his lead prediction uh, after... uh, after the young lady, I can't remember her first name, Lee Six, won the U.S. Women's Open. Um, and so a lot, a, lot of, a lot has been made. And so I thought, you know, we don't normally address two serious issues here in the Chunk and Run, but I thought, you know, let's, uh, let's mix it up a bit. Now, we're going we're gonna to get a little ridiculous here in the, in the next portion, but for your thoughts on Hank Haney, Pat, your thoughts on what you heard. Um... Well, first off, I will say that um, the women's game is 
I think it's actually, it, it is interesting to watch. I mean, from a standpoint as a golf fan, I mean, I think, um, you know, we saw in the women's amateur at, at the Augusta National where we had, and in, in the, at your course at Champions Retreat, I thought it was very riveting golf. If you, if you're a golf fan to watch that and to see these women play Augusta National for the first time in a tournament atmosphere, um, it's an important part of the game. So I, I don't, you know, I disagree a lot with, with Haney. Uh, you know, I listen to him probably, you know, mostly on the weekends, but he, this isn't new for him. This is something that he's done uh, or seems to kind of indicate with a lot of his discussions. You know, he has a huge disdain for the USGA, and then he'll kind of make, you know, sort of just off, you know, off-color marks about the women's game here and there. Nothing like this, but it, it's not – something that's unusual for Hank if you ever listen to him from a you know constantly or not constantly but at least from time to time but semi regular you know semi yeah. yeah but i mean i will say this i i i'm not a fan of the pc culture that we live in i i don't like that i don't like that you can't make a comment and then it goes viral or whatever and maybe it's taken out of context i don't know what it is but that there's just so much sensitivity to every single issue out there and i think you could actually make the case that what he's really saying is that the lpga has a little bit of identity problem you know they don't they don't have players out there like when you have a lot of players that you know maybe have the same last name or like we don't identify with that like when I'm watching, I watch some of that tournament. I'm looking at girls like Lexi, who I can pull for and root for and know who they are and has personality and whatever. Or um, I think her name was Jay Marie Green, who was a girl who's never had, you know, too much success on the LPGA, but, you know, has some personality and whatever else. I mean, there's just, you know, it, you've got to have a little bit of that when it when it comes to a tour and, and for any sort of watchability and I think there's an identity issue with the LPGA. I, I just, I don't, I don't think there's any interest in watching it. And I'm not saying it's bad golf or whatever, but for Hank to really point that out, I don't, I don't know if it's, I think the way he did it was probably wrong, but I, I don't think that he's just, I don't know. And here's the thing. That's the crappy thing about this is like I'm having a mince words right now because I know we're going to get backlash on Twitter and whatever, <laughs> whatever else because Pat's I'm a setting. freaking racist or whatever. I mean, it's not that's not the case. I'm not. Yeah. You know, I just it's it's not a sport that I really am that interested in watching, even though I know these players are fantastic. But you have to be interested in it. You have to have some sort of something's got to bring you to the game and there's just not a whole lot there when it comes to the women's game. And so just because Hank points it out in some way, whether what, what it is, you know, whether it's they're Korean or black, white or whatever, it doesn't matter. There's an identity issue there and it's not exciting to watch. And so that's basically what he was saying. He just said it probably in a, a piece, non PC way that everybody hated. Did I, did I did I did that make any sort of sense whatsoever? Yeah, I mean, I disagree with you a little bit. Like, I, I think it is actually if you if you actually if you like golf, like the game of golf. Now, a large portion of our audience only watches golf because they're betting on it, and it's really hard to find a place to bet on women's golf, much less play fantasy golf. So, uh, you know, if 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 you enjoy watching golf for the pure sport of it, I think the women's game is actually would would probably surprise a lot of a lot of listeners. Uh, because I mentioned actually, that in the start. If you were listening, by the way, I mentioned that in the start with the women's amateur. I thought it was that was you, you very. Did, you, did, you did, yeah. Uh, you know, so, I mean, and in fact, if I if if I think of other sports where men and women play, the WNBA, for example, the, those ladies are a hundred percent athletes. But to me, the gap in how they perform and what you're watching, the product that you're watching on TV in the WNBA versus what you're watching in the NBA are extremely different. And it's a wide gap to consume on TV. I think the gap is actually smaller when it comes to women's golf and men's golf when it comes to consuming it on TV. That's just my opinion. I, I, obviously, you know, your Tigers and your DJs and your Brooks of the world, like, 
they're they're the greatest golfers in the world, and it is not even close. But if you took the whole game and and all of the players playing professionally, it is actually easier to watch the women play golf than it is me watch women play basketball from it from an entertainment athleticism aspect of it. I mean, Lexi's crushing it, dude. Like. I, I was live in person at Champions Retreat for the Augusta National Women's Open, and these girls weren't even professionals. They're playing college golf, and they're hitting it to a lot of the same spots or near the same spots that I'm hitting it to at Champions Retreat, my home course, and would beat the brakes off of me. And and it's still kind of fun to watch. So I, I think that's there. There is a marketability issue with – the fact that the most dominant players in the LPGA right now happen to not be American, and that's the that from from the public view in the U.S., I think that's the issue. It's like we we want the top players to be American. Like that, we're going to consume when the top players are Americans. When Lexi Thompson is at the top of her game, that's what we're going to watch. But if you know, if if it's somebody that we're not familiar with. And, and I'm, I'm not saying, like, us personally. I'm saying, like, the culture. You know, Jung Hun Lee, six, who won, we, we don't have any – we can't we, – we have no ability to relate or, or – there's, there's just not the marketability there. And so I think it does make it tougher to watch. I think we're getting a little off topic. But with, with what Hank said, what I do hate about it is the people that – the lynch mob on social media that claim him to be racist. Like – I think that's taking it too far. Do I think what Hank said was insensitive and shouldn't have been said? Yeah. I mean, you and I have been on Sirius XM a number of times. We are now, you know, we have a public platform with TJ. I had I was on Sirius XM every Wednesday night for 2 years with Roto Grinders hosting the show. And you just have to understand like you can't say you have to filter some stuff. And you know, I I not that what he said is necessarily like all that in touch with, you know, pop cult like po- like politically correct culture, but I, I just I don't I don't think you can rush out and say the man is racist. Like, I don't I, I I don't think that. Now I think Tiger's comments were interesting. Tiger's comments were rather damning to Hank Haney, but I don't know how much of that is just is just Tiger not being real thrilled with Hank Haney. You know, wrote it, write, writing the book that he yeah, wrote and basically was, being I think popular. More of that. Yeah, he, he, Hank Haney is who he is because of Tiger Woods, and he exploited the crap out of that connection, which good for him. But I don't know that Tiger is necessarily a big fan of that. Um, so I take Tiger's comment with a grain of salt. Do I think Hank Haney should lose his job over this comment in, in terms of on Sirius XM? No. Uh, and I and and he probably will because of the the whole like PC culture like. You have to be so super careful of what you say and how you say it. Do I think he was dumb for how, doubling? How fu- you know what's crazy about that though is, is that you got a guy like, you know, one of the biggest gets that Sirius XM got to make to make them, you know, I don't know, reputable, whatever you want to say, was Howard Stern. One of the most, <laughs> he was the shock jock. You know, one of the most out there personalities said whatever the hell he wanted to say, and then so well, then they, they're they going to come. They have a barstool in. channel too, but but that's serious. And they have a barstool channel. So, that's different than PGA Tour. I mean, the well, I PGA get it. Tour is who bought the time on Sirius XM. I, I so it is it. the well, PGA you know Tour. Yeah, it is the PGA Tour who has chosen to suspend Hank Haney. I can tell you that right now. It is whoever calls the shots at PGA Tour XM Radio is who decided to suspend Hank Haney. I guarantee you that no one at SiriusXM had anything to do with that decision. I guarantee you that. I, not not because someone has told me that, but because I, you know, the Roto Grinder show that we did, for example, was just basically Roto Grinders buys the real estate for that show every week, so th- they pay for the yeah. content and they can have whatever kind of content they want. Just like Barstool pays and says, we're going to buy these hours of the day and this channel. We're going to pay what we want and we're going to say whatever the hell we want to say on this channel. And Sirius XM doesn't give a rip. Just write the check, bro. So it had nothing to do with Sirius XM, I guarantee you. This is a PGA yeah. Tour call, 100%. Which Whether is Hank Haney so, keeps his job or he doesn't. Yeah, 
Yeah, I mean, look, I don't, I don't know. It just, I think it's just so over the top. It's just this world we live in where you gotta, you can't say anything that's on your mind or whatever, and you just gotta. I mean, you know, look, I mean, everybody's got to be sensitive to certain things out there. I understand that, um, but I, I do agree with you. I, I don't think it was racist. I mean, I think, I think that's always the first thing people want to go to. And I just don't, I don't, in this case. How I different is it? How different is it than saying white men can't jump? Like if you Seriously. say, if you say right yeah, now, you're the right. Korean, the Korean women are absolutely dominating women's professional golf around the world. They are like, yeah, they, they just are like, yeah. Are there some American, you know, Caucasian stars on the LPGA? By the way, how is that A hundred percent. How is that disparaging? It's to not. Say, to, to, well, it is for the white men. It, it is for the white men can't jump. But uh, well, that is, but not to say that a, a, a country or a nationality or whatever or a or race is dominating a sport. Right. Now to say it's so by saying that it's boring or whatever he's saying, there's no identity in the fact that there's a, a Lee or whatever that's going to win. Okay, that's. That's almost like he's stating fact that they dominate so bad they're going to win. What's bad about that? What's racist about that? I mean, I, the, I just, the, I need the to fact is that. the fact is that you know, like there are way more African American dominant stars in the NBA right now than there are white dominant stars in the NBA right now. Like, so I just, I just don't. Again, I'm not saying his his comments were all that sensitive. They weren't. No, but, they were not. But they, I, I don't necessarily think that that means he's a racist. Maybe he is. I don't know Hank Haney. But I'm not I'm not going to be a judge of his, of whether he's a racist or not based on that comment. I, I'm just not. I, I think he, he, may have, he may have turned off the filter for a minute. He may be too comfortable where he's at on the radio. Because I think every time you put that headset on and you put that mic on, you better, you need to like, check yourself a little bit but and i don't think he was right for doubling down on it like on twitter today he was like you know i see yeah, i told well, you i nailed it quiet. that was dumb <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> that was really dumb but uh anyway he's, he's not a racist so enough of that let's move on the, the final question of the night the run question of the night is a funny one from a listener he actually sent it in like this week russell bowman shout out russell we need more chunk and run questions like this one. I thought this one was creative. Say you're on the PGA Tour and you're offered a sponsorship by Vagisil. <laughs> they want to put your logo on your visor and your bag. How much money do they have to offer you annually to make the deal worthwhile? And, and in addition, what would be some worst possible companies to be sponsored by if you were playing on the PGA Tour? Pat, you want to you start this one off? Uh, I gotta be honest. I was I had to go in and Google Vagisil. <laughs> I was like, man. I, I think don't, every I mean, chunk I, and run question you have to Google. I have to Google a lot of these. They they come up and I'm like, what in the? Okay, all right. So anyway, yeah, for Vagisil, for me, you gotta have. I mean, at least we're in the millions. We're seven figures. What? Dude, yeah. I'm like, I don't care what you want to put on my hat or my golf bag. For seven figures is your minimum? We've already talked about this when it comes to the member guests. I did mention that, you know, I like to feel comfortable out on the golf course, and I don't want just a bunch of the comments going left and right out there about Vagisil. Dude, I would and, – And that – I'd do it for six figures easy. Like – That actually – 150, leads, 200 grand, I'm in. Okay, well, that leads to my next one, which is who you know another like terrible one to be sponsored by, and it would be like uh, Imodium. You know, because I feel like if you're sponsored by like Imodium, people just have all kinds of open avenue to talk about you having the shits and whatever else. <laughs> like, I just feel like I just I wouldn't like it. You know, I thought Imodium was like acid reflux or something. No, no, it's like keeps you from having the shits. <laughs> I don't have that problem. <laughs> okay any others we're getting, some, um, we're getting some good youtube comments on this one that i can't share right now um so, you know like a modium or like mylanta you know there's one of those in there um 
don't know. Okay. I think that's, right. that's probably it. Yeah, I don't know. You could have the obvious, like, the the uh, Viagras and whatever, but I wouldn't care about that, I don't think. Yeah, no. At this point, like, I, at 35, I'm willing to just own whatever. <laughs> like, I don't care. If I were in my 20s, if I were, like, a Brooks Kepka and I was rocking Viagra, that'd be, I don't know. I'd have to get broke off. I think if they, I think if I were Brooks Kepka, you would have to pay me more to rock Viagra than you would the Vagisil thing. <laughs> I just, I, I wouldn't care about that. I, I said a few things. Number one would be PETA. If PETA wanted to sponsor me, there ain't no way. Like, I think PETA's a bunch of wackos. Um, yeah, PETA would not be sponsoring me It either. just wouldn't it's be cr- a thing. I, I, like, there's just absolutely no way if PETA, I'm not sure the amount would- of money PETA would have to offer me to to agree to that like especially if there were like stipulations that like i couldn't eat meat or uh, there's absolutely no way um no way um anything that comments Bryce... come in on that well of course you guys i know you southerners are republicans and whatever <laughs> else so you might i know you don't support PETA. of course no, they're I... talking like that but Actually, uh, we're getting a lot of positive comments. Uh, Casey Walton just said, uh, still one of the best ever sponsors is old MMA days when the Condom Depot was on every fighter's shorts. I, I remember that. I remember that. That's a good one. Uh, I also said I would not, you'd have to pay me a lot of money to do anything that was also sponsoring Bryson DeChambeau. Uh, see, see comments earlier in the uh, Oh, podcast. God, are you going to get upset, though, when you have, like, I'm using the grip that on my putter grip is DeChambeau's putter grip. No, I, just I don't care reach. about that. I'm just talking about, like, if I got to share sponsorship with that joker, that means I got to show up in a commercial with him like Tiger just did. You know, and next thing I know, we're on the blackboard drawing stuff about Bridgestone golf balls. I got to spend a day with this dick hole. I, there's, <laughs> I'm not interested in that. Uh, anything purple with a purple logo, I, I, I don't like the color purple. It's literally the only color that I don't wear. I will wear all kind of colors. I'm not a big purple fan. So anything purple. Is Imodium purple? I feel like Imodium's purple. I think um, the box is. And then adult diapers, I kind of felt like would be a tough one to do. Um, I think I'd rather do Vagisil than that. <laughs> I'm not a fan of adult diapers. I, I would not want to rock that on whatever those would be on my hat or my bag. I think it'd be weird. Can you believe we've spent almost depends. an hour and a half? That's what it, is. <laughs> it depends. Oh, on okay. the hour and a half on the on the RBC podcast. You know what this we is... missed. You know what we missed the one and done. Who's your one and done? Because mine doesn't matter anymore. Um, I'm gonna go with Stinson. Okay, I kind of like that. Um, <laughs> uh, hell, I mean, I'll go with whoever you want me to go with. Um. Do you want me to pick it? Go with Webb. Are you, have you taken I'd Webb go, yet? I, I've already taken Webb. I've, I'd probably go Furick. I haven't taken Furick. I'd roll with Furick. I'd go Jonas. By Bruce the way, there's something point. that's starting to make me think, second guess myself, that I've already taken Stinson. So if everybody out there who actually does listen to the one and done, my my second guy will be Bubba. Okay. Oof. Whoa. Really? Okay. Hey, I got to get. I got. I, I got a chance. So <laughs> I think I can. Anyway, all right. All Thanks for listening. We appreciate it. I can't believe we did an hour and a half RPC Canadian Open podcast next week for the U.S. Open. Though, can't wait. It's going to be a great episode for the U.S. Open. We'll be fired up for it. It's going to be fantastic. Hope you guys have a great week. Don't forget to follow us on all social media channels for the member guest content that you don't want to miss. Thanks for all those watching on YouTube and interacting with YouTube. Appreciate it a lot. Thanks for your support. You guys are the best. May your screens be green. See ya. Junkies. Oh, that was a good one. <laughs>